Okay, well, we're starting our next unit, which is pre-Civil War, and we're going to look at a lot of the causes um, that are, are going to be bunched together to bring about the Civil War. And one of those causes um, that's going to be one of the main things that's going to affect a lot of different aspects of the U.S. citizens in the 1800s, primarily the 1830s through 1850s, is the reform movement. And um, this is going to be called the, the, greatest, the Second Great Awakening, and it's a renewal of the religious sediment um, that's going to inspire uh, a bunch of other movements, whether it be our prison system, our public education, our thought process towards the African American. Um, it's going to all start from the religious and people's coming back to God. Okay. Um, here we go. Sorry about that. Took a little while there. The Second Great Awakening. Um, it's a religious movement, much like the very first one, that sweeps over the United States. Uh, it, you know, it says here in the book after 1790, but it's going to be primarily from the 1830s, 1840s, that you're going to have this religious movement come back. <clears throat> Then why they call it the Second Great Awakening was the Great Awakening was one of the reasons why people came to America, was re, was fleeing Europe because of religious persecution. And people were coming over here. And now we're going to have a uh, re-awakening uh, to this. And what's going to come about in the Second Great Awakening is there's going to be um, new factions of traditional churches that are going to that are going to splinter out. So, guys, what this looks like is you've got established churches, both Protestant and, and then you have the Catholic Church that you're going to have um, primarily in the Protestant Church a uh, belief that people are going to come upon that they are responsible that they have a personal relationship with Christ and that they can improve themselves through living a cleaner life through the Christian uh, values that are taught through the Bible. And there's going to be these preachers that are going to go across the country that are going to be teaching uh, that you should change, that, that people need to look at their lives and evaluate it, and that it's no longer just going to uh, church um, on Sunday and putting in all your actions to make you look like you're living a good life. It was um, preachers and writers that were saying, L examine your heart. And the heart, um, and through the scriptures, is going to see, you know, the heart is a central part. Love the Lord with all your heart is what um, the, the number one commandment. I believe that uh, Jesus talks about, and they're looking at the heart to change people. And that's vastly different than um, what you've been hearing in the church up to that point. Um, these individual um, revivals are going to be these large gatherings and, and preachers are going to bring in a lot, a lot of people and they're going to talk to them and it's going to have a profound effect on the population in the United States. And this is, again, as I made mention, um, Calvinism, Puritans, and that they believed in predestiny, which predestiny was saying that God has chosen who's going to go to heaven um, and who's not, and, and it's already been decided. And um, that's really going to be different than what the uh, preachers of the, the Great Awakening are going to say. They're going to say, no, you have a decision to make. Are you going to follow God and God's ways? And so when you say that, the individual has moral responsibilities to stand up against, you know, unjust practices such as slavery, such as the treatment of, you know, poor treatment of prisoners or no school system. Um, love thy neighbor. 
was was one of the commandments as yourself and so at these revivalism or a revival where they would mark, go through cities oftentimes on the east coast they would get these people to come together and they would come together for four or five days and they would preach um, the word and dive into the word during the day um, and get into the Bible. And then at night, you'd have these preachers come in front of the people and give sermons. And they were, they were powerful and affected um, a great many people. Uh, what was interesting that in the 1830s and 40s, 50s, and that they come about is the gospel is not only going to be taught to the white guy, but it's going to be um, in really uh, embraced by the African American slave and the African Americans themselves. Um, in the Baptist and Methodist church, we had both black and white. Uh, going to church service and to partaking in um, the message or the word of, you know, God. And Southern slaves um, would go to church with their um, slave owners. Now, they didn't sit in the same pews. They would sit in different sections, but you'd be hearing the same message. And the Southern slaves uh, relied on the message of Christianity, of the promise of freedom. Uh, Jesus' uh, message of, I've come to set the captives free, um, to give sight to the blind, to free the prisoners. That was the African American seeing that, that someday when they go to heaven, they're going to be free. And that was a big deal. Um, in the East, um, where and in the North, where the African Americans are free, they have their own churches. Um, so you have in the South, you have churches that are both attended by both black and white. And now this is not all by any means, but there are sections and new splinters off the Episcopal church that are going to be fundamentalists that are going to believe in the word of God as literal word of God in the church or in the Bible, excuse me. And they're going to take that and they're going to have both slave and, and slave owners in the church. Then in the North and in the East, you're going to have own separate um, African-American churches that are very, very popular and prosperous and um, are well attended. Um, you're going to learn about uh, trans transcendentalism a little bit more your junior year from your English teachers. But basically what the idea is, is there's a couple famous writers and um, philosophers, and the movement of transcendentalism uh, is that we're going to simplify life. We're going to boil it down to let's let's pay attention to the five things in life that are the most important. And this is a message that's clear today that you're going to hear people a lot of times talk about what's important in your life. Don't have a hundred different things. Simplify. Make your life. Um, meaningful by by living for the most important things and you decide what those most important things are and um, uh, a, a famous uh, philosopher by the name of David uh, Henry David Thoreau he put this in into practice where he said the 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 person has a moral obligation that when he's seeing something that is not just is not right for society, that he has a um, responsibility to have civil disobedience. Well, that's a peaceful refusal to obey laws. And that's going to be a big part of um, Martin Luther King's civil rights movement of peaceful refusal. And he's going to get it from the 1840s um, philosopher of Thoreau and big, big part of that. And again, we're using it today that people are oftentimes uh, the people that are the most happy and the most successful as far as their families and that are the people that don't necessarily have all that much. Um, we will look into uh, the reforms movement after it goes from the churches. It moves towards uh, other areas too. And 
One of the places that uh, the reformers will, will move into is um, the prisons. And in the 1830s, uh, 1840s, prison life is, is not a good place. Once you're put in prison, they kind of throw you out and there's, it's anything goes. And um, where we're, uh, America's the, the most uh, liberty of any nation in the world at that time. The most freedom is given to any individual on the, on the place, uh, face of the earth. Their prison systems were, they were really harsh. They were really, really harsh. And as we do the Great Awakening and the idea that I have an ob obligation to improve and stand up for right things, people will start to look at our prison systems. And one of the most famous persons was a person by the name of Dorothy Dix, who um, is able to convince 10 states throughout the, primarily in the East, that they look in to improve the conditions for the mentally ill and the mentally sick people that are being treated as criminals and just being thrown and cast aside for being mentally retarded um, and having disabilities. And she's able to get the, the, the ball rolling to say, hey, listen, the, the way we're treating these people is morally um, wrong and we, we should not do this. And she won over uh, most states. Um, the other one was in education. In the early 1800s, school was not mandatory. Um, it, it, was, it was done at a private level. Uh, if you were rich, you could get you know, better education, same as maybe today. But um, you were grouped all together. You weren't put in by age. Um, and Pennsylvania is the first public school system in 1834. Uh, for to mandate that we're going to have a tax base uh, school, a tax supported school, um, and we're going to uh, separate children by age. And um, one of the biggest reformers is a guy by the name of Horace Mann, who in Massachusetts sets up and becomes a school state superintendent um, for the state of Massachusetts. And he actually starts setting up early teacher training and curriculum reform, and it takes off. So you go from <clears throat> no state compulsory to by 1850s, all the states um, across the, the board have got um, publicly funded elementary schools. Now, you won't have a lot of kids go to school past elementary a lot of them are going to go back and work on the farm, but they're going to be taught how to do the basic reading and writing because one of the big concerns you had was if a kid can't, if a person can't read or write, they can't be in, in a free society expected to do the right things to improve the society. We're going to stop there now um, because the next couple sections we're going to look at is um, sectionalism and that. So hold up. But uh, we now have gone and taken a look at the reformers. Now we're going to take a look at a couple videos.